Welcome everybody to abstract data types. In uh, programming layer, which is what we have seen the last few weeks, we have moved from the concrete machine language to assembly language, to pseudocode, and then to expressing algorithms. We then went from algorithms using simple variables to algorithms using arrays. We implemented sorting and all kinds of really neat algorithms. Now we take a step up in the abstraction and talk about abstract containers, which are composite structures that we do not know the implementation of. So those structures in computing circles are called abstract data types. <clears throat> so let's see what the abstract data types uh, look like. So from the um, to put the abstract data types into a context, we need to look at how we view data. And uh, in computing, we view data and uh, from three perspectives: the the application level, the logic le logical level, and the implementation level. So at the application level. Um, which is usually called the user level, we view the data within a particular problem. So in other words, we just see the behavior of the abstract data type, and we see how inputs are turned into outputs, and that's about it. So we see it from the user perspective. Then we have the logical level, which is the abstract view of the data and the set of operations to manipulate them. So in other words, we look at it from the user perspective because we see the behavior and how the inputs and outputs change, but we also understand the reason why that behavior and that input get transformed into that output. And then from the implementation level, which is a specific representation of the structure that holds the data items and the coding of the operations in a programming language. So in other words, this is where we see the nitty gritty implementation of that abstract data type, how the behavior is implemented in a programming language and how the data is persisted in a specific data structure. So once we see these um, views of data, we can actually understand a few of the abstract data types. Now there's um, <clears throat> from the logical implementation, there's two ways to implement containers, in other words, abstract data types. We have the array-based implementation, and we have seen already what an array looks like. It's basically all the objects of the container are kept in an array, and everything is manipulating using arrays. Or we can implement it with a linked-based implementation. That is, objects in the container are not kept physically together, right next to each other, but each item tells you where to go to get the next one in this structure. So let's take a look at the first abstract data type. It's called stack. A stack is an abstract data type in which accesses of data are made at only one end or one point of the abstract data type. And that point 
uh, makes it behave in a LIFO um, behavior. And LIFO stands for last in, first out. So the last piece of data that went into this stack is the first one to come out. The insert behavior of data into a stack is what it's called a push. And the delete of any data from a stack is what it's called a pop. Okay, so let's take a look at sample. I like to see things with simulation. So I have found a website from the University of San Francisco at California where it could actually show us the simulation visually visual simulations of data structures of many data structures obviously we're not going to be covering all of them but it also includes the basic ones which are the ones that we're going to be including so let's start with let's start with the stack simulation using an array or implementing using an array so here it is this is an array we are very familiar with that and <clears throat> what we can start doing we, we can start pushing numbers so we're going to start pushing the one so notice that the top is the one that tells me where in the array will be put the next item so it grabs the one and puts it in that index which was zero so the value one it's hold on the first on the sub zero of the array position and then the top is incremented so the next time that we push another value it will hold that top go there save the value in that position and increment the top this is a pretty cool um, simulation because you can actually vary the speed at which it simulates it so let's keep pushing more numbers into this stack so now the 3 is being pushed and then the 4 is being pushed and you get the point and you keep pushing until you have um, reach the maximum that you can push in the stack. Now what about a pop? What happens when you pop? So at this point we have pushed one, two, three, and four. Four was the last in, and therefore if we pop, it's going to be the first out. Let's do it. So it takes the top decremented it and then goes to that position of the top after it was decremented and takes that value out so now the stack looks like one two three if we pop it again it decrements the top that's number two now goes to that position in the array sub two and gets rid of that value So you get the point with this stack simulation. <clears throat> All right, very interesting abstract data type. Now there's another one called a queue. A queue is an abstract structure in which items are entered are at one end and removed from the other end. <coughs> <coughs> so this behavior is called FIFO for first in, first out. Now, in non standard queue terminology, it will be called NQ when you enter or insert an item into the queue, or DQ or delete or remove when you delete it from the queue. <coughs> So now let's take a look at an example in the simulator 
of the Q. So Q's using an array implementation will look something like this. This is the array. It's an empty array for now. And instead of having the top, since we can actually insert from one end and remove from the other end, we need a head and a tail. And initially the head and the tail point to the first um, in the array. So now let's enqueue the number one. So notice how it takes the tail value because we're entering um, elements of the queue through the tail. So it takes the tail value and goes to that position in the array and saves that value in that position and then increments the tail. Now we're going to enqueue the number two. So again, takes the position in the tail, saves that value there, and then increments the tail. So the tail is always that element of the array that is empty and ready to receive new data. Then we enqueue number three. and we enqueue number four. So now we have a very similar structure to the stack. If we look at it from the array perspective, we have values one, two, three, four. But the queue behaves different because now if we want to dequeue a value, is not going to take it from the tail, it's going to take it from the head. And right now the head is pointing to 0, which is the, the index sub 0 in the array. So if we dequeue, the head value is going to go there and take me there, and it will take out that value from the queue. And now it will increment the head because the head is no longer in position 0. Now the head is in position 1. So the Q now only has values 2, 3, and 4. Remember, value 1, which we just the Q, was the first in. I'm sorry, was the last in. No, it was the first in, and now it's going to be the first out. Sometimes I confuse myself. OK. So let's dequeue it again. So it's going to go to the position sub 1, and it's going to take out the 2 and increment the head. So now it's only these two positions. And you get the point. So stacks and queues can also be implemented with linked lists or I should say link structures. And <clears throat> let's take a look at how that's implemented in our University of San Francisco website. So now let's take a look at the stack implemented using a link list. So we are going to see just the top Okay, there's no arrays. Notice that there's no arrays whatsoever. We're going to push the number 1. So we create this variable that will hold the value 1. And then we have the top, which is our variable, that points to where the top of the stack is. Then we're going to push the number 2. Again, we create another variable that will hold a value 2. And then what we did was we made that variable point to 1, which was the top of the stack before we pushed the 2. And then the top is being 
update it with the new top, which is now the number two. <coughs> now we're going to push the three. Notice how the value is put there, then it goes to where the top is, and then the top is updated with the new top, the newly created variable. And same thing with number four. Four is put there, it's pointing to the old top, and then the new top is updated with the number four. Notice that there's no arrays, no sub-indexes, nothing of that nature. This is stack implemented using linked lists. Now let's pop the number four. How is that how is that updated? Well, you take out the value and then you update the variable that is pointing to the four. Now it's pointing to the three. We pop it again, we get rid of the three, we update the top variable, and now it's pointing to the two. And you get the point. So now let's take a look at queues implemented using linked lists. Remember, queues have a head and a tail, so now we need two variables that point to different sections of the queue. We're going to enqueue number one. Creates the number one variable and makes the head and the tail point to it. That's in the case in which we only have one element. The head and the tail point to that element. Indeed, the one element, the only element, has become the head and the tail. Now we add, we enqueue number two. So notice how first we took the element that is in the head and we made it point to the new element and then the tail that was pointing to the first element now it's pointing to the number two which is the new element let's see what happens when we enqueue the number three creates the three then the head I'm sorry the tail it's updated at this point just the tail is updated and then whatever was the tail before or whatever the tail was pointing to before it gets updated with the new element and then finally we enqueue number four four is created then whatever the tail was pointing to points to the new element number four and then the tail is updated with the new element number four now what happens when we dequeue? Notice that we are in a queue, therefore when we dequeue it will do that from the head. So most probably it's going to get rid of the one and update the head. That's dequeue. It's rid of number one, updates the head, and moves on. Dequeue number two, updates the head, and moves on and you get the point. So <clears throat> that's how stacks and queues are implemented using linked lists. Now what about lists themselves? Think of a list as a container of items. So here are the logical operations that can be aim applied to lists. For instance, you can add an item, you can remove an item, you can get the next item, whatever that is, or you can ask whether there are more items in the list or not. Um, lists can be implemented as well with arrays or with linked implementations like the one that we just saw. So let's take a look at our simulator, website simulation, and let's see how lists are implemented.
Oh. They're no longer maintained. Okay. <clears throat> so, I'm going to have to skip the uh, simulation of lists. Um, but the idea is almost the same, man. You know, you you if you're implementing an array, you, then you know um, you traverse the array um, because you know the al at the logical level, the algorithm that uses the list does not need to know how it's implemented, whether it's an array or whether it's a list or whatever. And <coughs> we have written algorithms using a stack, a queue, and a list without ever knowing the internal workings of the operations of, of the containers. So we know how, basically we know how a stack behaves, or in a queue behaves, or a list behaves, but we don't really care um, whether they contain uh, people, cities, numbers, strings, or whatever values. Um, so now let's go on, move on into another abstract data type and um, that is called trees. <clears throat> now structures such as lists and stacks and queues, which are the ones that we just briefly, briefly covered, are linear in nature. So only one relationship is being modeled. Um, but trees, on the other hand, are more complex because they're capable of um, implementing complex relationships. So for instance, um, a family relationship. If we want to model a family relationship in a program, we will need some kind of hierarchical structure. And a tree is such a hierarchical structure. So let's cover one example. There are many different types of trees as abstract data types, but one of the most commonly used ones is a binary tree. So what is a binary tree? A binary tree is an abstract structure in which each node is capable of having two successor nodes, also called children nodes. And each of the children um, being nodes in the binary tree can also have up to child two child nodes. So so every node in the tree is capable of having two children. And these children can also have up to two children and so on and so forth, giving the tree its branching structure. Now the beginning of the tree is a unique starting node called the root, which is not the child of any node. So this is number one, and this tree will be the root node. And then each node has two children, or at most two children. So for instance, uh, the root has two children, two and three. Um, and some of them will only have one children, or no children at all. If they have one children, then it will be like the three, which has the right child. Or number four, which only has the left child. And there are ones, and there are some nodes that do not have any children, and those are called the leaf nodes. They are at the bottom of the tree. So let's take a look at a binary tree simulation. <coughs> in our simulator website. Sure, somewhere in here has got to be a tree, binary trees. Oh, okay, so we have the binary search trees. So, so let's cover, let's cover a little bit more about the, um, the binary trees, because there is an abstract data type called the binary search tree. In a binary search tree has the property that every node to the left of its root is less 
than the root and every node to the right of its root is greater than the root then when I say less or greater it could be any um, semantic of comparison between the different nodes it could be numerical it could be alphanumerical as in for strings etc so in a binary search tree each node if you look at it from the from the perspective of 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 the nodes each node is the root of a subtree made up of its left and right children and always its left children will be less than the root and its right children will be greater than the root so let's take a as an example this binary search tree the 15 is the root so all the children to its left will be less than 15 and therefore all the children to its right will be greater than 15 and if you take any node in the tree it will have the same property so if we take 19 19 the child to its left it's 18 which is less and the child to its right it's 21 which is greater <coughs> excuse me so that's the characteristic of the binary search tree so let's take a look at how binary search tree is being simulated in our website <clears throat> so if we insert number 15 let's say we're going to try to simulate the same tree so we're going to insert 15 there is 15 and then we're going to try to insert 17 so it takes 17 and says okay is 17 greater or less than 15 since it's greater it goes on its right um, branch so it becomes the right child of 15 then we're going to insert the 1 1 is less than 15 and therefore it will be inserted on its left now what happens if we try to insert 7 so 7 is less than 15 but it's greater than 1 so when we insert it it will go to the root say oh it's less so you go to the left so is it greater than one or less than one so it says it's greater than one so it goes to the right of one and then we're going to insert a five uh, no I'm sorry uh, uh, and we're going to insert a 16 so let's insert 16. 16 is greater than the root so it goes to the right child which is 17 but it's less than 17 so it goes to the left and then we're going to insert a 19 or a 21 and again it goes through the root and finds out its position based on comparing it with the subsequent subroots okay now what about if we want to delete so th the root is 15 this is a node with two children and this is a node with only one child on its right and these are the leaves what if we want to delete number 17 so if we want to delete number 17 notice how goes through the root first says oh 17 must be greater than the root there you go you found it and then what you do is you take and replace the number 17 with its left hand side child which was 16 this way you're guaranteeing that the new 
value will be less than its right hand side branch which we know that because that's how he ended up in the left hand side of 17 because it was less than 17 so if he takes its place then we know that this uh, 16 will still be less than 21 okay so now what happens if we just delete uh, one in a very similar fashion we'll go through the root find that it's less than 15 find the one and then replace it with the seven which at this point it, since it doesn't have a left hand side it will have to be replaced with the seven which is this right hand side at any rate it still preserves the um, the condition that that is less than 15 that node is less than 15 and so you get the point with binary search trees now <clears throat> binary search trees um, it's used in um, a binary search tree is like a sorted list in that there is a semantic order in the nodes. Now a binary search tree has this shape property of a binary tree, right? We just said that. That is, is an, a node in a binary tree has uh, a search tree can have either zero, one, or two children. In addition, a binary search tree has a semantic property that characterizes the value in the node and the tree. <clears throat> So it's very prone to be used for searching purposes. And, and that's probably one of the most efficient structures in order to um, insert and delete order lists. And that is the, the, uh, the binary, the binary search tree. All right, so now let's take a look at another abstract data type is called the graphs. So a graph is a data structure that consists of a set of nodes called vertices in a graph and a set of edges that relate the nodes to each other. And we have two types of graphs. We have the undirected graph, which is a graph in which the edges have no direction, or a directed graph in which the edges have a direction and they go from one vertice vertex to another. So this is an example of an undirected graph. <clears throat> Notice that um, it's not the same thing as a tree, obviously, because uh, first of all, nodes can have more than one connection, I mean more than two, so it's like June in this case has a connection with Sarah, Judy, and Susie. So it's not a binary tree. And also notice that uh, there's no root. There's no root and um, and you can have um, what it's called cycles. In other words, you can go from June to Sarah to Bobby and back to June, which in a tree you will not be able to do that. So, so graphs uh, depict much more complex uh, relationships. And so this is an example of an undirected um, graph. And this will be an example of a directed graph in which the vertices are cities and the edges are, for instance, flights. So you can go from Dallas to Chicago, but you cannot go back to Dallas. To go back to Dallas from Chicago, you will have to go to Denver and then to Atlanta and then to Washington and then back to Dallas. So the direction of the of the uh, edges are very important. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So, given that, um, there's there are three classic searching algorithms defined in a graph, and in each one um, answers a different question. And um, the first one is called the depth first search algorithm, and 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 the the question that a depth first search uh, algorithm answer is can I get from like in the case of the cities can I get from city Dallas to city Houston using my favorite airline so so suppose that this is the uh, flights f um, between different cities for a particular airline, my favorite airline. So you want to be able to know if you can get from from one city to another, and that's what the depth depth first search algorithm in a graph answers. <clears throat> um, and it's called the depth first search because we start at a given vertex, you know, the city where you want to start from, and then you go to the deepest branch and explore as far down one path as possible before taking alternative choices at earlier branches. So let's take a look um, at an example. And I think that the, the website will give us a better example. <clears throat> Here it is. It's the depth first search. So this is a pretty cool uh, website because it randomly creates a um, directed graph. And you can also use it as an undirected graph. But a directed graph will show you in a much better way the depth first search. And um, it randomly generates a, a directed graph, <clears throat> and it will also show you how the depth first search is being implemented. So let's start with city number two. So we start at city number two, <clears throat> and we want to know if from city 2 we can get to city 7 or 3 so let's run that first search so it starts from 2 and it knows I can go to 0 and then from 0 I can go to 1 and then from 1 I can go to 2 but wait a minute I already visited 2 so I'm not going to count it so I can go to from 1 I can go to 3 and then from 3 I can go to 5 and then from 5 I can go to 6 and then from 6 I can go to 4 and then I can go anywhere else so from 6 I can also go to 7 and then I cannot go anywhere else so I go backtrack to 6 and then I can go anywhere else so I go backtrack to 5 and then I cannot go anywhere else so I backtrack to 3 and I can go to 7, but 7 is already counted, so uh, I'm not going to include it. So I go back to 1, and I can go to 6, but 6 is already included, so I'm not going to count it. So I go back to 0, and then I can go to 2, but 2 is my uh, origin, so I'm not going to count it. And then I'm going, I'm back to um, 2, and then I can go to 5, but 5 is already counted, and I can go to 6, but 6 is already counted, and I'm done. So this Two zero one three five six four and seven becomes the depth first search from city two. So can I go from city two to city six? Yes, I can do that. I can do that by going to zero one three five six. Is it the best optimum way of doing it? No. Who cares? 
that's not what the that first search is trying to answer. It's just trying to answer whether you can get there. Now the most efficient way would have been two to six direct flight, right? But like I said, uh, the first search algorithm only answers whether two cities, whether you can go from one city to another. So that brings us to the second type of algorithm, graph algorithm, which is the breadth first search. And this particular uh, kind of algorithm answers a different kind of question, which is how can I fly from city X to city Y, whatever those X and Y are, with the fewest number of stops? So if we were heading back to our example here, the fewest from 2 to 6 would have been a direct flight from 2 to 6. So that uh, breath first search is going to come up with a different answer. <clears throat> um, and, and the way that it's going to do is it examines all the vertices adjacent to the starting city, the starting vertex, before looking at those adjacent with those adjacent to those vertices. And, and a breadth first search uses a queue, not a stack. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I'm, I'm sorry, on, on that first, the, the, um, on a, on a that first search algorithm, it uses a, uh, a stack. That's the best way to implement uh, the that first search. But in the breadth first search, it uses a queue, and it and it's understandable why because it, it the approach is different. And let let me show you the um, oh man, it modified. Let me show you the uh, breadth first search. So again, this is a randomly generated. Um, randomly generated um, graph, directed graph. And now we're going to try to go from city 2 to 6, right, in the most efficient way. That's what the uh, breadth first search does. So let's tell it that we want to go from 2 and we, we want to run it. So it's going to go from 2 to 4, from 2 to 5, from 2 to 6, so as it does it, it's including all these from 2 to 4. So now it goes into 5 and says, okay, from 5 to 3, and then goes into 6 and says from five, some 6 to 5, it's already there, and then from 6 to 7, that's included, and then from 5 goes to 3, and from 3 goes to 1, but it can also go to 2, but it's already there. So you do not include the cities or, or the or the vertices by going to the deepest one. You just try the nearest vertices or connection to the nearest vertices first. And then you expand the transversal of the graph um, from the from the children first. So let's try doing the simulation again so we get a better picture. So we're going to start again from 2. 2 to 4 includes 4. 2 to 5 includes 5. 2 to 6 includes 6. Then it can't go anywhere, so it picks 4. From 4 to 2, it's already there. Then it includes 5. From 5 to 3, so it includes 3. And then 6, from 6 to 4, but 4 is already there. And 6 to 5, but 5 is already there. And then 6 to 7, so it includes 7. 
and then takes three and three to one that's good and three to seven but th seven is already there so it doesn't include it and then from seven to five but it's already there and seven to six but six is already there and then from one goes to two but two is already there and and that's it I mean we cannot get to zero as you guys notice because zero is a city where everybody goes out but nobody goes in <laughs> kinda um, so in this case if we try to answer what's how can I get from city 2 to city 6 with the fewest number of stops the answer is right there it's a one direct flight and the way to implement the, the way to implement the breadth first search algorithm is by doing it with the queue so as you notice you start queuing up uh, the nodes the adjacent nodes and then and then you start um, dequeuing them as you include them in the list okay so <clears throat> that's as far as the other algorithm and I'm going to cut the video uh, right now and I'm going to include another video lecture for the subprogram section